Welcome, fellow brave believers. This is Kingdom Cast. I'm your host, John Griffin. You're watching this on Kingdom in Context. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please do so. Um, if you learn anything from this video, if you like it and, you, and it blesses you in any kind of way, or if you think the information will bless someone you know, please like the press like, drop a comment, and then share it with you um, on your social media so that other people can find it. Um, this is how we get around the suppression of the algorithms and, and of the outright censorship that, that uh, religious channels are facing on YouTube. So thank you for joining us tonight. Also, if you haven't already gone over to Kingdom Cast and our New Jerusalem media channels, please go subscribe to those as well. And you can actually find those under our channel listings here on Kingdom in Context, or you can just go to the search bar on YouTube, type in Kingdom Cast, and you can subscribe directly from the search result. And that will help us. We're trying to get that particular secondary channel. It's like a backup channel, but we're trying to get it to a thousand subscribers. That way we can actually broadcast live this podcast Monday through Thursday on that secondary channel. YouTube won't let us do it until we get to a thousand subscribers. So if you can go help me out with that, I'd really appreciate it. And as always, I want to thank everyone for showing up for the live chat. We, it looks like we already got quite a few people here. And as you saw from the thumbnail, we're going to be talking about Satan tonight, asking five good questions about Satan, and then I'll be addressing those from Scripture. Um, a Big Ray G is here. AC is here. Charlene D'Souza is here. Elias Stewart, James 122, The Great Deception, TX Sunshine. Irene C., Cindy Hogland, Set Apart Temple. Welcome, everyone. John C. Lump is back. Karen C., Jubion, Jubion Kenobi is back. Sean Davis. West Plays Music, Ellie Kate Smith. Welcome, everyone. It looks like uh, Janet S., The Line Within Us, Miss Peggy D., Dylan T. Welcome, everybody. Stephen Belk, Daniel Heck. Welcome, everyone. Bobby Moe, David Shearer, James Henry, Salted Cedar, Aramiston Stone, Michael Harris. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I think there's more I'm, I may be missing. It. Paula Disciple, Crystal C., Lynette Moody. L. Wilkins 25, Light of the Hill Ministries, and Jared Rice. Welcome, everybody. And Harry and Gather Mac. Shalom. Welcome. So tonight, guys, um, please, as always, try to hold your, your questions till the end. We're going to go over a couple slides here and just these, these uh, basic five questions about Satan himself. But as you may have seen from the intro, uh, be looking for here in the next couple of weeks, Ken and I are going to come uh, back to Season 3 of Honor of Kings. So we're excited. And we we're, we find a, a good time to work out with our schedules. And so we're excited to come back and bring that to you for season three. But tonight, let's talk about the bad guy, the guy that so much hype is around, so much bad information is around. So we're going to look at the scriptures and see exactly what the scriptures talk about. Because to me, that's like, you know, that's the most important part, right? We have to, we have to um, know what the scriptures say about all these characters so that we're not misinformed. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. So the traditional concept that, that most uh, traditional Catholic Christianity has taught us over the last 1,700 years is that this Satan character was kicked out of heaven. He and a whole bunch of uh, other angels, and they generically say, you know, a third of the angels of heaven were kicked out with him and that they were cast to the earth and and uh, he, he can't go back to heaven and that's the general premise, right? And that he's a, he was an angel, but, but now he's a, you know, misshapen, grotesque, beastly looking character. That's a hybrid between some sort of animal and an angel. And that, um, you know, there's all kinds of myth and lore that's popped up about this character from the scriptures over time and throughout various cultures. But let's look at what the actual scriptures say. As always, guys, I'm this, I'm just that weirdo. That's like, you know, if the Bible doesn't actually say it, then I don't want to, you know, I, I just want to try to go with in line in the context of what the scripture is saying as much as possible. So that I feel like that's the best way we can stay grounded to these ideas. And, and so that we have a coherent storyline. And as in any story, you have your protagonist, that's your good guy. And then your antagonist, that's your bad guy. And we have multiple antagonists in the Bible. So one of them that we're going to look at is Satan, but we'll also be talking about his hosts, those who serve him and why, but, well, so, uh, but the main focus is going to be on who Satan is and what's up with this guy. So let's jump into it real quick. First big question, guys. How did Satan decide to go in against God and sin? How did Satan decide to go against God and sin? So that's what most people will ask. I've heard this question asks. I've heard this question asked from unbelievers. And that's a, probably the most like coherent way they could get it out, right? They don't exactly know how to ask the, the best questions about Satan because they're so uninformed on what the scriptures say. 
so they just they have this general premise like i just explained carried over from catholicism this story that may not be accurate to what the scriptures say and that story is that well satan was in heaven and he convinced a third of the angels to rebel against god and they were kicked out of heaven and so the natural question that forms from that story they've heard is well how did satan decide to go against god and sin what's the deal there so there's a lot there's more to it than just that general premise and we're going to go over that tonight but if you're just answering this just in a simplistic most general way of how did satan decide to go against god and sin which assumes angels can sin and actually done an entire morning cup of context on that uh, if you want to go check out our money morning cup of context playlists you can see that video can angels sin yes they can and he did so through what wisdom of solomon chapter 2 verse 21 through 24 explains to us it says such things they did imagine and were deceived for their own wickedness has blinded them as for the mysteries of god they knew them not neither hoped they for the wages of righteousness nor discerned a reward for blameless souls for god created man to be immortal and made him to be an image of his own eternity nevertheless through envy of the devil came death into the world and they that do hold of his side do find it and we're gonna that last comment there that through the envy of the death uh, through the envy of the devil death came into the world and they that hold of his side meaning the devil's side do find it um do find death right because that's the result of unrighteousness and sin and so we're going to actually jump into that a little bit further in another book that's no longer in your in your american bible um now i think it's interesting guys and you'll probably many of you that have watched our honor of king series will probably realize this as we're going through these slides tonight but much of this information about satan that gives you clarity to the storyline is can be found in books that the american canon doesn't have in it that it's in the Ethiopian canon or the uh, or it was in the American canon until the 1800s and they removed it. So it's, how interesting is that, that there are several books that give us a greater understanding and that for whatever reason, our, 20, our 21st century culture in the United States, the Bible that we have that's comprised of only 66 books, which is less books than any other Bible from other countries throughout time because it's been edited over time. <laughs> it it is very important information that helps you understand the um, helps you understand the the actual storyline of this character called Satan. Well, I've got good news. Uh, Light of the Hill Ministries, Wisdom of Solomon was in your American Bibles until the 1880s. It was one of the 14 books uh, that was removed, according to my understanding. So it used to be in your Bibles. They used to consider it canon, and it wasn't until about the 1500s that uh, the Catholic diocese started to call these other books deuterocanonical meaning they're a secondary canon. They were still considered canon, but they gave them less weight than the other 66. And so then a, a couple hundred years after that, when you have these two dudes, Westcott and Hort, they decided to remove 14 books from the American canon, and Wisdom of Solomon was one of those. So it used to be in the Bible. Um, it's also, there's we're going to look at another we're going to look at another verse or another book called the Apocalypse of Abraham that used to be in an Armenian canon in the 1600s, but was never put in the American canon. So it's also going to help us out. But let's keep going here. Number Question number two, why does God let Satan tempt mankind? Well, is that question even formed right? <laughs> so let's. this is a big problem that we have that you see a lot of these typical questions coming from agnostics and atheists or even, you know, well-intended young young in the faith believers and they just don't know how to form their question right because they don't have enough knowledge of the scriptures and enough context so we get this a lot we we see this question off asked a lot why does god let satan tempt mankind well there's there's it's explained to us in a variety of different passages we're going to check in at Apocalypse abraham chapter 23 verse 1 through 14 and it explains some of this uh some of this ideas as god understands it in relationship to mankind falling into the temptations of the devil of satan that goes along with what we just read in wisdom of solomon right where it says those who take his side do find death so it says here in chapter 23 1 through 14 now look again in the picture and see who it is who seduced eve and what the fruit of the tree and what is the fruit of the tree and you will know what it is to be and how it shall be with your seed among the people at the end of the days of the age and all that you cannot understand i will make known to you for you're well pleasing in my sight and i will tell you of those things which are kept in my heart by the way, guys, real quick, this uh, the context here in Apocalypse Abraham is this is um, a vision that Abraham is having during the Genesis 15 um, moment where he offers up uh, 
cuts cuts the things up on the altar and offers them up and he has a vision he goes to sleep for a while and he's having this vision while he's asleep so you have to the, the this book pieced together with jubilee's account and the genesis account give you a full well-rounded event of what happened during genesis 15. so he goes on to to explain further because this is god through an angel talking to abraham he says and i looked into the picture and my eyes ran to the side of the garden and i saw there a man of imposing height and mighty in stature incomparable in aspect and he was embracing a woman who likewise approximated to the aspect of his size and stature and they were standing under a tree of the garden of eden and the fruit of this tree was like a bunch of grapes of the vine and standing behind the tree was one who had the aspect of a serpent having hands and feet like those of a man and wings on its shoulders six pairs of wings so that there were six wings on the right and six on the left and as i continued looking i saw the man and the and the woman eating the fruit of the tree and i said who are these who are embracing and who is the one between them who is behind the tree and what is the fruit that they're eating? And he said, this is the council of the world. And this one is Adam. And this one who is their desire upon the earth is Eve. But he who is between them represents ungodliness and their beginnings on the way to perdition, even Azazel. And I said, oh, mighty eternal one, why have you given such a as why have you given such as him the power to destroy the generations of men in their works upon the earth? And he said to me, those who will to do evil over them, I gave him power even to be beloved of them. So this is basically the father through an angel explained to Abraham. Why have you, you know, Abraham's asking why, why are you letting the devil have this obvious ability to influence mankind and have power over them? And the, the creator answers, straight up those who will to do evil over them i've given satan power so it starts with man it's not that satan can just tempt you or overpower you and make you do something you don't want to do it starts with man your desire your evil is what leads you to temptation right so what is it the you guys remember the verse put it in i think it's in james chapter 5 um that it's through our own desires and our own lust that we're drawn away and enticed to sin if anyone remembers that verse off the top of their head put it in the chat and I'll put it on screen. But that's what the father is explaining here in the apocalypse of Abraham, that it's through the temptation, the own internal desires toward evil within man that subjects themselves to Satan's temptations and then eventually under his control uh, because you get snared into sin. Does that make sense? So let's keep going and we'll look at uh, another question. How did the other angels decide to side with Satan? Well, <laughs> this is under this premise of this storyline that a third of the angels rebelled with Satan and were cast down to the earth. So this is what I would call a malformed question. This is a question that the common person asks that is not in accordance specifically with what Scripture says. I'm going to throw something out here kind of crazy to everyone tonight. Revelation 12 does not say a third of the angels rebelled with Satan. If that's it, James, I appreciate it. James 1, 13 through 15. I think that's uh, what I was the verse I was asking for. By man's own sin, he's enticed and led away into sin. Yeah, it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Thus, when the lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin's accomplished, it brings forth death. Thank you, brother. Thanks you, James. So essentially, as we just read in the Apocalypse of Abraham, that's the same answer. That's the same theological concept um, that we see expounded upon in James 1, 13 through 15. So you guys see, y'all can do honor of kings too. It's not that hard. All right, guys. So how do the other angels decide to side with Satan? That's under the premise of this Catholic story that a third of the angels rebel with Satan. And I know a lot of people are probably going, wait a minute. Wait a minute, what? I thought I thought Satan had a whole bunch of angels at his disposal. If you can show me in scriptures specifically, and I'm going to go over Revelation 12 here in a minute, but if you can show me anywhere in scriptures or any of the books that used to be in, in canons that were taken out, where it says a third Satan has cohorts of a third of an angels from heaven with him, and I'll be glad to look at it, but I have not been able to find it. So let's look at what the scripture does say about who helps Satan and who they are. Okay, and also other angels that rebel because there's more to the story. There's it's there's uh, details. This question is very vague and it doesn't actually cover the details. So let's look here in Jubilees chapter five, one through six. And it says, and it came to pass when the children of men began to multiply in the face of the earth 
and daughters were born to them, that the angels of God saw them on a certain year of this jubilee, and that they were beautiful to look upon. They took themselves wives of all whom they chose, and they bare unto them sons, and they were giants. And, lawless increased on, and lawlessness increased on the earth, and all flesh corrupted its way alike, men and cattle and beasts and birds, and everything that walked on the earth. All of them corrupted their ways and their orders. They began to devour each other. And lawlessness increased on the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of all men was thus evil continually. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted its orders, and all that were upon the earth had wrought all manner of evil before his eyes. And he said that he would destroy man and all flesh upon the face of the earth which he created. But Noah found grace before the eyes of the Lord, and against the angels whom he, that's God, against the angels whom God had sent upon the earth, he was exceedingly wroth. And he gave commandment to root them out of all their dominion. And he bade us to bind them in the depths of the earth. And behold, they are bound in the midst of them and are kept separate. So this is after Noah. And we're going to go over this also in Jubilees 10 in a minute. So during the days of Noah, this, and this is actually the book of Jubilees is being spoken to Moses. It's the narration of the angel of the Lord that followed with Israel talking to Moses on Mount Sinai during the 40 days. And he's explaining to them, what happened leading up to the flood in chapter 5 of Jubilees? And as I just read there, at the very end there, in verse 5 and 6, the angels whom God sent upon the earth. So this idea that uh, in the beginning of, of uh, Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and also Jubilees 5, 1, when it came to pass that children began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, and the angels saw them and thought they were beautiful and lusted after them and took wives of whomever they chose, that's because the angels were already here. Do you guys catch that? The angels were already here because they were sent intentionally to help mankind govern the, uh, as it as mankind was flourishing and populating in greater numbers. That's how they were tempted. They did the angels didn't look from heaven and say, "Oh, look at all those attractive women on the earth." The angels had to come down here and interact with them before they were tempted and drawn away with lust. So think about this, guys. Once they're here, they see the women. They were here on mission, intentionally sent here. And this is what Enoch expounds to us with greater detail. So let's get to those verses real quick. First Enoch 9, 6 through 10. He says, You see what Azazel has done. He has taught all unrighteousness on the earth and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven, which men were striving to learn. All right. As we talked about a few weeks ago in our milk and meat, guys, remember that's there's a difference between Azazel and the other rebellious angels. So that's one person. Is Azel. Now we're going to get into another group on different context of, of description. And Samyaza, to whom you have given authority to bear rule over his associates, and you have gone to the they have gone to the daughters of men upon the earth and have slept with the women and have defiled themselves and revealed to them all kinds of sins. And the women who have borne giants, and the whole earth has thereby been filled with blood and unrighteousness. And now behold, the souls of those who have died are crying and making their suit to the gates of heaven, and their lamentations have ascended and cannot cease because of the lawless deeds which were wrought on the earth. So we've got two things here, guys. Azazel, he is teaching unrighteousness on the earth and revealed eternal secrets that were preserved in heaven, and he revealed them to men. And then it switches, and it says, Now Samyaza and his associates, they took wives, and they slept with women. It doesn't say that of Azazel. There's, there's this distinction, guys. And this is why we even get to the judgments of Azazel and Samyaza, and his associates, and they're different judgments, as we talked about a few weeks ago. So this is why it's a big deal to understand that this, you know, had we had the book of Enoch this whole time, we would have a better familiarity with the storyline of the Satan character. And I'm going to explain to you how this Azazel character is actually Satan as we continue going tonight. So what I want you to understand, though, is what Jubilees explains to us is these angels were sent down to the earth. Angels that were sent down to the earth took wives, and that is Samyaza and his crew, separate from this character called Azazel. Azazel was the one, as we just read from the Apocalypse of Abraham, was in the garden tempting Adam and Eve. So that means, as you guys have all heard, remember the Garden of Eden was set in the garden, was set in the land of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, and also Jubilees chapter 3, and 2nd Ezra chapter 6. So therefore, it's already, it's, that means this Garden of Eden 
was set down and there were angels inside, as I've explained in the past, that were helping Adam and Eve understand what to do and how to do the law and how to keep residue for the first fruits and all this stuff. And so this angel, Azazel, whom we just read from the Apocalypse of Abraham, he, it would not be unnatural for him to go and be in the Garden of Eden because there are already other angels there helping Adam and Eve understand what to do and how to tend to the garden. Because remember, Adam and Eve are flesh. They cannot see the Father. The Father, remember, he says, no flesh can see me and live. So therefore, he uses his angels as intermediates, right? As as messengers, like Hebrews 1.14 says, their, their messengers are sent out to help those who are inheriting salvation. Well, Adam and Eve were intended to inherit salvation. So this is, I mean, you have the angels there in the garden to help them. So it's not uncommon for this Azazel angel to actually be down there not above in the, in the layers of heaven above, but to actually be down in the garden, mixing around, doing who knows what his job may have been, but he goes to the garden of Eden to tempt Adam and Eve, which there were already other angels there. So, you know, but according to wisdom of Solomon, it was through his own envy that he decided to go down in there. Can anyone put in the comments why Satan may have been envious? And this is, I'm going to give you my, um, my understanding of this. And so don't feel pressure, guys. You don't have to, you know, just give me your best guess if you can, because this is something that um, a lot of people I've never heard a lot of people talk about, especially with any kind of scripturally sound answer. Why was Satan envious of Adam and Eve? Yeah, thank you, Daniel Heck. It also talks about it in Jubilees 4, that the watchers should instruct the children of men to do righteousness and judgment upon the earth. So they were sent to help mankind for a reason, which is their job, according to Hebrews 1.14, right? It was intended for them. But once they were there, this particular group, Samyaza and his other angels that were under his authority, they messed up. They lusted after women and took wives and started having kids, which were giants. All right. Um all right, so Josh Pashik is saying his his idea is that angels were higher on the chain and didn't want to serve man. So he's he's thinking that's why Satan was um, envious of mankind. Dylan T has something very similar. I think it's because God wants wanted angels to serve man. Uh, we like I just said, Hebrews one fourteen that that is their purpose, right, to help us. Um, and Kingdom Truth is saying he didn't want to worship humans. Um, Corey Fowler is saying, I think God asked him to bow to man who was jealous because he was created first. I think you may be getting that from the first book of Adam and Eve. And that's, I don't know how accurate that is. But guess what, guys? Honor King Season 3, we're going to go over first book of Adam and Eve. Let me see here. I think there's a few more. Miss Carla Marwick is asking, because we were made in Yahweh's image. Or she's saying that's her answer, I should say. James 122 is saying men would be greater than the angels. And that could be why Satan was envious. So essentially that that's probably the most specific. Every other people answered very closely to my my estimation and my understanding as well. But this specific answer here from James is more more along the lines specifically of how I would answer this idea that. The whole purpose, as we hear from 1 Corinthians 6, 3 and Revelation 24 through 6 and um, uh, other passages that this idea that at the resurrection, guys, mankind will be made higher than the angels, just like Yeshua was. And that is uh, at, at Yeshua's resurrection. At, we're put into a priesthood, which is a, a position of authority where we're given more authority than the angels. And this was always intended. This was always part of the, the grand storyline. This is why... Paul is explaining in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, that we will judge angels. So to be a judge over an angel, that means you have to be your their, their priest, basically. You have to be an authority over them. And this is what we're granted at the resurrection. So this is a huge deal. And that is my best estimation of why Satan would be envious of mankind. So let's go back to these slides real quick, and we'll keep finishing up this idea of what is going on with this Azazel character compared to the other angels did these other angels are, are was it a third of them most people in the comments already know the book of enoch right it was only 200 
So, so if that's a third of the angels in heaven, then that means there's only 600 angels in heaven. Is that, is that even close to accurate? <laughs> no, I would say no. No, the, the scriptures, the Psalms and other places talk about myriads and myriads of angels. Uh, you know, first book of Enoch, uh, chapter one, verse two, and also the book of Jude, verse 14, it says that when the, you know, the Lord returns with thousands of his angels. So that's clearly debunks the idea that these particular angels that rebelled in the days of, of Enoch through Noah, that we see explained in Enoch and Jubilees and Genesis, some Yaza and his crew, that there were only 200 of them sent down here to help with mankind. Azazel, he was already doing it. He's kind of like a side character, but yet at the same time, he's also participating in the corruption, except Azazel did not take a wife. Do you guys see the distinction there? You have angels coming down to help mankind. There's only 200 of them. But then you've got this other character, this Azazel guy, who's lumped in in this judgment moment because he's also been teaching stuff to mankind that men were striving to learn that he's that's called unrighteousness. So if you read the book of Enoch, you'll see in chapter seven and eight, the other angels were also teaching mankind unrighteousness in a variety of ways, but they took wives and this Azazel character didn't. That's why he didn't get, he didn't get locked away in Tartarus at the flood like these other angels did. That's why he's still out and about roaming around. This is why we don't see him get locked away until Yeshua returns. So let's keep going through some of this idea real quick. So let's go to number four. Is Satan permanently kicked out of heaven? This is a big part of this narrative that we, we've heard carried over from Catholic Church, right? That he was he was cast down from heaven and he and a third of the angels, well, we just, hopefully, we just debunked that idea, right? That it wasn't, he doesn't have a third. We're going to go over who his cohorts are, but it's not other angels. Those angels were locked away in Tartarus. And, I'm, and we're going to go over the idea of who, does he have working for him and what happens to them? Because it's, we'll just, and we're going to break down some of the language of the Greek in revelation as well. So number question, number four is Satan permanently kicked out of heaven. This is a, uh, something to give us par a little bit of a, a little bit of a um, parameters of understanding the context of Satan interacting with us today and why. So let's look here in Job chapter one, six to eight, guys. Most of us would understand this is a book that would be, he's talking about Job, who was uh, an Edomite that lived in the land of Midian or in that area roundabout. about. Um, and this is post flood. This is actually supposedly penned during the days of Abraham. Genesis 36 talks about Jobab as the same guy. Okay. That's for a whole nother show, but just to give you a quick idea of perspective and context to the book of Job. Chapter one, verse six through eight. It says, and it came to pass on a day that beheld the angels of God came to stand before the Lord and the devil came with them. And the Lord said to the devil, where, or, where art thou come? Or meaning, where'd you come from? And the devil answered the Lord and said, I come from encompassing the earth and walking up and down in the world. For one, guys, you notice that word compassing. This is a Septuagint translation, by the way, I'm showing you. It's very similar to the, to the Masoretic, but I love that it uses uh, the word compassing the earth because that helps you understand the biblical creation model. Because, you know, a compass goes on a flat plane in a circle. Yeah. So he's compassing the earth and walking up and down on it. So he's not. But what's he doing at the very beginning of this in verse 6? He came before the Lord. Where's the Lord? The Lord's in heaven. He came before the Lord with other angels. When the angels of God came to stand before the Lord and the devil came with them. Well, it's my understanding. It's my from, from the Torah, I would suggest the angels are going before God because it's a part of the Torah, right? You guys remember Exodus 23, three times a year, your males shall present themselves before the Lord. Angels are following Torah in heaven, guys. So yes, three times a year, the angels must present themselves before Yahweh. Yes, they follow the Torah in heaven. It is the eternal instructions of God for living. If you're alive, these are the instructions for righteousness, for right behavior. Three times a year, the father wants to see his boys, all males, report three times a year. Angels, they're all male. Jubilees 15, 27. So here you go. Satan comes with them. Can you guys imagine this? What can you understand? Can you guys under, like we literally see in this moment that Satan steps before the father with these other angels? And what does the father say? Does he say, apprehend him immediately. He's not supposed to be in heaven. 
No. He says, where have you been? And Satan replies nonchalantly, yeah, you know, compassing the earth, walking up and down in it. And then they start having this conversation about Job. The father is not ordering Michael immediately to just bind this guy and, and throw him into the lake of fire. No, there was, a, like I've said before, there was a um, there was a judgment that was sent forth in the book of Enoch. When all these other angels were being judged, there was a judgment that sent forth separately for Azazel. That's a different judgment than all the other angels got. The other angels are already locked away before like the time of the flood. But Azazel was not locked away. That's why he's still out and about. He doesn't get locked away until a specific time. So just like in, in modern you know, civil cases, you can have a, a judgment pronounced, but there's a time when you start serving your sentence. I'm trying to put it in modern vernacular for you, okay? So this is what we see in the book of Enoch with these, these 200 angels that took wives. They had a specific judgment that was proclaimed to them, and after a certain amount of time, supposedly about 500 years, they were sentenced. They started serving their sentence to be locked away in Tartarus. This is Azel character, got a different judgment, but his sentence doesn't start until later, Revelation 20. So this is because he didn't do the same crime. <laughs> if that makes any sense. So this, uh, that's why he's still out and about and able to go into the heavenly realms of the firm and above. What's even more ironic is in my, in my understanding, he's actually abiding by the Torah to present himself before the father, but he's uh, obviously we know that he's, he's not, uh, his end goal is unrighteousness and he's considered unrighteous, but yet he chose this opportune time to present himself, which I think is hilarious. Can you imagine him standing in line, the face the other people might be making? So let's go into Job chapter two, verses one through two, where it says, and it came to pass on a certain day. This is a similar thing, right? The, the angels of God came to stand before the Lord. and The devil came among them to stand before the Lord. And the Lord said to the devil, where did you come from? Then the devil said before the Lord, I'm coming from going through the world and walking about the whole earth. So we know this guy's not locked away. We know that he's out and about. He's getting a different punishment than the other angels. The other angels are already locked up. So then a lot of you are probably going, yeah, okay, well then who's a third of his angels? Well, like I just tried to show, he doesn't have a third of the, of the angels of heaven on his side. That's a false paradigm. It's a false part of the, the narrative from Catholicism. That is not, and it's been... It's been carried, uh, it's been believed by Protestant preachers for the last two, 300 years and propagated, but that's literally not in scripture. Again, many of you are thinking about Revelation 12. We're going to go over it in just a minute. So Job chapter one and two, and it came to pass on a certain day, the angels of God came before the Lord and the devil came with them. So he's still able to go into heaven if he wants to. He has that ability. We also see in 1 Peter 5, 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Yes, he's definitely on the earth running around. We know this. We know Revelation 12, 9, right? That he's he deceives the whole world. Number five, and this is going to go into who are his cohorts, is how powerful is Satan? Should we truly think that this guy can just do anything he wants? No. Let's look real quick, though. Let's look at, at what Scripture describes about him, okay, and about who helps him. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. There was no place at, at, uh, found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, and the serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So a lot of people are saying, oh my goodness. So this guy, oh, see, Sean, he's got angels with him. Who are those? And a lot of people think the previous verses in Revelation 12, 1 through 3, where it talks about... Um, uh, the dragon sweeping his tail and knocking a third of the stars out of the sky. They think that that means he's bringing it. That's the interpretation. People try to say, well, see, look, because it says he's got angels with him in the latter verse. Then the, the earlier verse in 12 in revelation 12, three, it must mean that he's pulling all these stars out of heaven. He's got a third of the angels rebel with. No, that's not in the scriptures. That's an interpretation of this sign in the heaven about a third of the stars. Does that make sense? But that is not literally saying he has a third of the angels on his side fighting for him. He's not. He's in the utmost minority. There's, in my opinion, millions upon millions of angels from, from what the scriptures describes to us. Myriad, myriads times myriads, as Psalms talks about. There's millions of angels, if, if not billions. And only a very fraction of them rebelled. Because the Father is good. 
And guess what? The ones that rebelled didn't do it when they're in heaven. They did it when they came down to the earth for a mission. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So the father's ways are good. It produces goodness. And when you're around it, you want to do it. And you don't even think about rebellion. In my opinion, you want to do with the ways of the father. So the, the free will of the angels to sin or not to sin it. He, the father's made it very, very difficult for them to sin. And it's only the ones that were sent here, apparently on some sort of long-term mission that they got caught up in temptation by the you know attractive women of the earth and were enticed to sin. But as a result, this, this angelic character called Satan, he's been up to, he's been up to some problems because of his envy for a longer time than the other angels. And this is why, in my opinion, he is more crafty. He is more subtle than any of the other creatures in the garden. And that's why he knew not to take a wife because of the type of, I'm just speculating a little bit here, guys. I'm just saying he's intentionally skirted some of the disobedience because he knows certain judgments would ensue. And he's not as powerful as he needs to be to escape that judgment. Michael and the other six um, archangels are much more powerful than this Azazel character. Azazel's low in the totem pole, guys, compared to the other archangels. So just keep that in mind. This is why he loses right here in Revelation 12. <laughs> he loses. The dude, he, he can't even, he can't go out, Michael and, and the other good angels, you know, they, they're in this moment. And by the way, this Revelation 12, 7, 9 moment, this war that's talking about, I personally think that this is going to be happening. And this is a whole other show, guys, as far as the timeline. But I think this is going to be happening right close to the day of the Lord. So it's not, this is not something that's already happened. This is something that has not happened yet that John has seen about events pertaining to the day of the Lord. So, this moment here where he and his his angels and maybe people are asking, but Sean, wait a minute. Doesn't he, well, he says he has angels right here in this passage. Who are they? What, where they come from? What scripture tells us that these other, because we know the angels that were part of Samyaza and his associates in the book of Enoch that took wives, they're already locked in Tartarus. They're not getting out until Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15 at the end of the millennial reign. So what's going on with these angels? Well, guys, let's look at the Greek. This is the part that I always try to, stress as part of finding context. If we're comparing other chapters and what they say about a word or a term or a phrase, sometimes it's as simple as just going into the actual phrase, the actual word itself and looking up its definitions and uses. So at its simplistic, most basic common usage, the word angelo, agalos in the Greek is the word for messenger or an angel. So this is an idea that it can be a messenger. And then in various uses in, in um, the New Testament, it's used for an angelic messenger, meaning Someone from heaven that's supposed to be a good messenger of God. Those are generically referred to as angels. But the word does have other uses, even for humans, by the way. I think it's like four or five times in the New Testament where it uses the word agalos for a human messenger. So that in a messenger is someone that that helps his master, right? That does the sort the bidding and the servant, uh, the servant work of his master. So who are these people that are considered the angels slash messengers of Satan that are trying to fight? Michael and his his boys, and that you know obviously Satan and his his boys lose. So let's keep looking here in Jubilees chapter ten five through eleven. It tells us, and this is the only place in Scripture that tells us who actually aligned themselves with Satan, and it's not angels from heaven. It says in verse five of Jubilees ten, and you know how your watchers. That by the way, this little context for you. This is Noah talking to God through through an angel. Uh, he's talking to an angel, you know, but trying to get a communicated message to God to have something resolved. He says, and you know how your watchers, the father of these spirits acted in my day. And as for these spirits, which are living imprison them, hold them fast in the place of condemnation. Let them not bring destruction on the sons of your servant, my God, for these are malignant and created in order to destroy. Let them not rule over the spirits of the living for you alone can exercise dominion over them and let them not have the power of the sons of the righteous from henceforth and forevermore. And Lord, our God bade us to bind them all. That's the narrator of Jubilees responding to the request from Noah to deal with these unclean spirits that were the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, the giants that were birthed from Samyaza and his boys taking wives and having kids. When those giants were killed at the flood, their spirits were still on the earth as unclean spirits, and they were disembodied, and they were overwhelming the descendants of Noah, leading them into temptation, like he says, malignant created in order to destroy. And Noah's praying to the father, stop, what, you got to do something about this. There's all these unclean spirits that are left over after the flood. So this angel then gets the command from God and says, all right, we need to bind these spirits up. Except they only bind 
90% of them. And we're going to read that. And it says, The Lord our God bade us to bind all. And the chief of the spirits, Mastema, came and said, Lord, creator, let some of them remain before me. Let them hearken to my voice and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are for corruption and for leading astray before my judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And he said, let the tenth part of them remain before him. That, that's the creator. The almighty said, let the tenth part of them, that's the unclean spirits, remain before Satan, him. And let nine parts, that's the unclean spirits, descend into the place of condemnation. And one of us, that's the angel speaking, he commanded that we should teach Noah all their medicines, for he knew that, that, we would, that they would not walk in uprightness, nor strive in righteousness. And we did according to all his words. All the malignant evil ones were bound in the place of condemnation, and a tenth part of them we left, that they may be subject before Satan on the earth. Guys, it's that simple. Those are his messengers. This is why Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we battle not flesh and blood. Principalities, princes of the air, darkness, and high places. See, these unclean spirits can traverse the air if they wanted to. We know they do. And they've been, you know, these are the things that are affecting, you know, the, the, the kings of the earth for all this time. And they're under the authority of Satan. See what I'm saying? So there's a lot going on here. We even see the uh, that both these unclean spirits and Satan are being dealt with on the day of the Lord when Yeshua returns. Enoch chapter 54, verse 1 through 6. says, I looked and turned to another part of the earth, and I saw there a deep valley with burning fire. And they brought the kings and the mighty and began to cast them into the deep valley. And there my eyes saw how they made these instruments, these iron chains of immeasurable weight. And I asked the angel of peace who went with me, saying, For whom are these chains being prepared? And he said to me, These are being prepared for the hosts of Azazel, so that they may take them and cast them into the abyss of complete condemnation, and they shall cover their jaws with rough stones, as the Lord of Spirits commanded. And Michael and Gabriel and Raphael and Phanuel shall take hold of them on that great day and cast them in the, in the on that day into the burning fire, excuse me, in the burning furnace, that the Lord of Spirits may take vengeance on them for their unrighteousness in becoming subject to Satan and leading astray those who dwell on the earth. We also see more detail about this in Enoch chapter 55, verse 3 and 4. And when I desire to take hold of them by the hand of the angels on the day of tribulation and pain because of this, I will cause my chastisement and my wrath to abide upon them, says, the, says God, the Lord of spirits. You mighty kings who dwell on the earth, you shall have to behold my elect one, that's the Messiah, how he sits on the throne of glory and judges Azazel and all his associates and all his hosts in the name of the Lord of spirits. So what do we see, guys, in Revelation 13? We see that Satan is gives his power to the beast. So we got the beast and this other guy, this other character, this false prophet that does signs. You know, the, the second beast does signs for the first beast. But the first beast is getting his power from Satan, the dragon. So there's a hierarchy here of the enemy. Satan, first beast, second beast, unclean spirits at the bottom, doing the doing the little the grunt work. You see what I'm saying? All of them get taken care of. We, Revelation 19, 19 through 21, the beast and the false prophet thrown in the lake of fire. Satan's locked away. In my opinion, from my understanding of this, the unclean spirits are also destroyed in the lake of fire at the beginning of the millennial reign. That's why it's only Satan that pops out at the end of the millennial reign in Revelation 27 through 10. So he, there's no other angels. In Revelation 20, let's go to this verse real quick. One through three, there's no other mention of other angels being locked away, guys. It's just these unclean spirits, the hosts, the messengers, the assistants, these things that, that willingly subjected themselves to the authority of Satan. And Satan are being dealt with as well as, as well as the beast and the false prophet. So there's no other angels like angels from heaven that were good angels that rebelled with Satan. No one came and took Satan's side. No one, Satan didn't convince a third of the righteous angels in heaven that they should disobey God and try to take over the throne of God. This is Catholic doctrine. <laughs> oh, by the way, and all these books that would explain all this to us conveniently been taken out of our American Bibles. Just something to consider. So let's read Revelation 21 through 3. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him 
so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. And after these things, he must be released for a short time. So guys, this whole concept here is, as we just read from Enoch 54, which lines up with Revelation 20, Michael and the other archangels have these huge chains of immeasurable weight specifically designed for Satan and his cohorts to wrap them up. Guys, these are spiritual entities. These are not men with flesh and blood. These are unclean spirits. They're called spirits. They're not flesh and blood. And Satan, who's an angel, a spirit, he's not flesh and blood like we are. So these special chains, whatever they're made of, I don't know, but I know they're real. They bind up these unclean spirits and the spirit of Satan, which remember the word spirit, guys, it doesn't mean a ghost. It just means a different entity. It's a different type of being, just like we've talked about you know, the bodies of angels on our milk, milk and meat episode a couple months ago. It doesn't mean that it's a ghost. It means that it's, it has different capabilities. It's made of like a different physics, if you will, a different, a different than us who are born of the dirt. We're very limited in our bodies made of dirt, but these spiritual beings seem to have bodies made of something else. Like, a, like angels from heaven, they're made of water and spirit, the spirit of God, the breath of life mixed with water, and that's how they're created. So this is why everything in heaven has real tangible tangi tangibility to it, right? The white robes that we get in our resurrected spiritual bodies are going to be made of some sort of cloth that can be, you know, cover a spiritual body. So this is why these chains, just like everything else in heaven that we see in visions, mountains, trees, water, streams, animals, food, they're all, this is a different type of, of creation, if you will. It's from my understanding. And it's not the same as the stuff that was made on our level here on the earth. So these guys, these angels have these special chains, which is why it's being drawn attention to in the book of First Enoch 54, 55, that these chains are specifically designed to, to take care of Satan and his cohorts, those who subjected themselves to Satan. So we know who those people are, according to Jubilees 10. And it's not a whole bunch of other angels. The only other angels that rebelled were locked away in Tartarus. So this is, this is hopefully, guys, hopefully you're seeing that this the enemy himself, he's got, he works within certain parameters. Because if he steps outside of that, judgment can come faster than to him than what he's already uh, transgressed and been promised to be judged according. So he's literally playing within the bounds of his of the law of God, if I could put it like that, if that makes any sense. So yes, as the Book of Jude talks about other angels, they don't speak, to, um, they don't, they don't dare curse or speak a, a bad word against Satan as far as trying to curse Satan because that's not their job. They're not God, right? And they're not the Son of Man. That's there's only one that's going to judge wayward angels, and it's you know it's Yeshua, and we're not there yet. We're going to be a part of that priesthood, but we're not there yet. But Yeshua specifically is going to judge Azazel. So when Satan was trying to go after the body of Moses, um, this is why you know you would have uh, reference to Michael not slandering Satan because it's not his place. He's not the judge over Satan. He, they already know Satan's going to get what's coming to him. It's already been declared back in the days of Enoch. So all this time. Satan is skirting the law, in my opinion, from my understanding. He's skirting the law enough to not get in any worse trouble, <laughs> if that makes any sense. He has to be crafty, because if he breaks the law too much, you already saw what happened to these other angels who took wives, and they transgressed a severe law, creating these unclean spirits, which is a huge no-no, things we still deal with today. So, yeah, it's pretty crazy, but that's why... Satan is powerful. Sure, he can deceive the whole world. He's very tricky, but he still plays within God's rules to try to get away with stuff as much as he can. So the more that you know the behavior of God, the better you can be about avoiding any deception that he may throw at you so that you now understand where he comes from, what he's able to do, help understand the biblical creation model is very helpful as well. But then as far as literally what's prophesied over him and who works for him, so that you don't think that the angels of God in heaven, just a third of them, a third of possibly billions, <laughs> suddenly just decided they didn't want to serve the most loving creator, the most amazing, magnificent, praiseworthy, 
entity and all of creation who created everything that they just were like, yeah, we're up here. Everything's good, but we're just going to choose darkness and death. No, that's not how it worked. It's not at all what the storyline in scripture is. A very small group of, of watchers were sent down during the days of Jared to help mankind, to help them learn right behavior, which is called righteousness. And they got tempted by some attractive women and sinned. Satan also was envious. You can speculate on what specific reason I personally think is because he knew that we were destined to be in authority over him. But Satan is also envious. And these very small fraction of, of angels, apparently 201, decided to do some bad things. But think about this. Think about the inverse. That means you've got millions upon millions, in my understanding, possibly billions of angels that have not transgressed, that do not want something different. They love the kingdom of heaven. They love where they live. They love the Father and the Son. They don't want anything. They don't want their own kingdom. They love the kingdom they're in. And they love you. They want to see you join them in their house, their kingdom. This is why they rejoice when a sinner comes to salvation, as Jesus tells us. This is why they love us and they follow the law, God's instructions for living, the law of God that's kept in heaven and are sent out as ministers to help us. It's, it's a beautiful thing, guys. I just hope that um, I, I hope to dispel some of the bad information about Satan so that you can be encouraged to know that the father has got your back. So we go to him in prayer. We walk in his ways, which is called righteousness. We believe that his son will resurrect us on the day of the Lord and give us the promises of the covenant. And this is how we overcome the devil, right? This is how we overcome him. So what is, what is Revel many of you guys already know this first, right? But what is Revelation 12, 14? Um, no, I'm sorry. I think it's actually 12. Yeah, that's the one that just says that the perseverance of the saints. So one second. We overcome him with the word of our testimony. But he says that the, the Satan actually comes to attack us, those who keep the commandments of God, that's his behavior, and the testimony of Jesus, which is knowing that our high priest Yeshua will resurrect us and put us into a greater position than even the angels. We end up judging them. So this is, this is a beautiful promise of the covenant. I just hope that people are encouraged and don't fall into bad Catholic doctrine, which causes nothing but doubt. And that's why I think it's there, to be honest with you. I think it's the, the biggest troll on, on believers and for 2,000 years, or for about 1,700, 1,800 years. It's the enemy literally masking the priesthood and twisting everything about it to give us corrupted doctrine. But through that, through that corrupted storyline of Satan, we're hearing all this weird stuff about how he somehow was powerful enough to trick a third of the angels in heaven to go against the only thing they ever knew and choose... <laughs> a reign of death in their own kingdom. No, guys, this is not. And this is, of course, bad information like that is what lends people to believe stories about this pre damic race stuff as well. Because that part of that narrative is that the earth was given to them. And then when Adam and Eve were created, that's why the devil was envious because they was going to have the earth stolen from them. No, no, the devil never had other angels with him by his side that were actively helping him do this other stuff. Those are in texts that do not hold to the test of scripture. What we have in scripture is the devil. This is Azel guy teaching mankind some bad stuff and getting a proclamation of future judgment as a result of that. But then the other angels that were around him during that day actually did some things worthy of punishment sooner. And they they got their punishment and they're serving their punishment while he, Azazel is still out running around doing bad stuff and tricking mankind. So he's going to get his. It's coming when the shoe returns. That's why we say, come soon, Lord, come. Right? I'll take some questions if anyone is interested. Uh, if, if anyone has any questions about some of the stuff I talked about, and if I didn't address something you may have thought of, you guys are welcome. As always, just put them in all caps. That way I can get to them quickly, and I can see them easily. When I'm scrolling through the chat here, 
Yeah, Daniel Heck, this is a verse that I try to express to people a lot to make them to help them understand and realize that um, heaven is where the the angels are created, which is they have to understand the biblical creation model, right? That there's multiple layers of the firmament. We live on one of the bottom layers and there's all these other layers above us where the angels were designed to live. And so there was a it was a problem that the angels were trying to live down on the earth long term and habitate with women and, and have babies and have families and all that stuff. And 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 they, as we see from uh, Jubilees and Enoch, there was some malice in them having children because their children were created in, as malignant in order to destroy and oppress. So it wasn't like they were just, oh, we want to have we want to have wives because we we want to have families like um, like mankind. It seems that there was something else at play here, and that's unfortunately leads into speculation. But uh, the point is, as they're being reprimanded for their sin, it's explained to us that man was made on the earth to live on the earth. We can't live in heaven above, and angels were made to live in heaven above and not on the earth. So when we try to mess that up, you have a lot of problems. But the bodies of angels can traverse both heaven and earth. Man's body cannot go above the firmament. We cannot live in heaven. Um, it will not work for us, if you will, if I could say it like that, especially because it's above the firmament. That's why the Garden of Eden had to be brought down below the firmament and planted in the geographical region of Eden for Adam and Eve to be inside of it. Because we cannot go above the we cannot live above the firmament. We have to have our resurrected bodies, which are bodies made like angelic bodies, to to go above the levels of the firmament. This is what Hebrews 4.14 talks about. So it's that's what Yeshua accomplished with his new resurrected body. Looks like we have a couple questions in the chat. Uh, let me see here. All right, let me scroll through. It looks like we have a couple good questions. Let me pull some things up real quick. All right, so we get a famous, famous question when this topic comes up, and it's a. Uh, Mr. Bear is asking, how would you explain Daniel 1013? Explain that for me. All right, let's go to it, guys. I'm going to pull this up so you can see it, and we can all go over it together as always. So this is Daniel 1213. It says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was, was withstanding me for 21 days, and then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to me to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. So what do you guys think this is? Prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I've been left there with the kings of Persia. And who is this speaking, guys? Put it in the chat if you know. Do you guys know who this is that's speaking? Do you guys see that this, behold, a hand touched me? And set me trembling on my hands and knees. Then he said to me, do me be afraid, Daniel. For the first day you set your heart on understanding this and humbling yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. Do you guys see this? Let's see if I put anyone put it in the chat. So a lot of people think that this is uh, Gabriel. Right? Do you guys see that? Good old Gabe. That's right. That's right. So what did we just read in Revelation 12, 9 through 7? That Michael and his boys, those are angels, fought Satan, another angel, and his associates, his messengers, his angels. What are those? What did we just talk about? Those are the unclean spirits. And what was I what was I explaining about their actual bodies, their spirits? They're not flesh and blood, but they have different capabilities. They can move stuff, they can touch stuff, they can interact with stuff if they choose to. I don't know, I don't understand how it works according to physics, but they literally manifest all the time. This is why you have an abundance of videos that are uploaded on YouTube about people seeing demonic spirits. They call them shadow people, and that they'll move stuff around their house, or they'll knock something over, or they'll Try to do stuff, right? And in more severe cases, they possess people. So the point is, they have some sort of power 
to interact in with other spiritual beings. So Nick, Nick uh, dies on is, I'm not sure if you're trying to put the equate sign, but you say angels to unclean spirits. Angels are a spiritual type of being. And think, think of a, uh, Guys, think of like species, okay? Think of like kind of like a biological term, like a species. An angel is a species of creation. Mankind, made out of dirt, is a species of creation. So we're not called spirits. We're called mankind, right? Made of the dirt. Angels are called spiritual beings. That's why they're called ministering spirits. Unclean spirits are still spiritual beings. They're just not good. They're unclean. That's why they're called unclean. <laughs> and from my understanding, they can't get clean. This is why it says they were created as malignant in order to destroy and oppress. So it's basically like if if the the result of an angel who's a supposedly made as a clean spirit results in mating with the human woman and the outcome, however they did it, was a spiritual being. It was not something that's a that is considered a part of mankind. So basically the woman's womb was being used as a host. And so therefore the, the baby that was produced, which is we, we call them Nephilim in the Hebrew or the gigantes and the, and the translator Latin referenced as giants. And yes, they were bigger, but also refers to their entity was different. This is why they're called Nephilim that call the fallen ones. They're unclean spirits. They can't become clean, but they are not made like mankind they're a spiritual being so just like a, a spiritual angel which is a spiritual being can look like a man so can unclean spirits but then if they want they can change their form as we see in scripture but also as we see in people's testimonies as well they have a different capability a different type of physics at their availability which allows them to fool mankind and to rule over them as we have seen for the last four or five thousand years so, yeah, Paul, Paul of Disciples is called dirty spirits. I mean, in a, in a sense, yeah. But the point is, you got two spiritual beings interacting with each other. So Gabriel's a good spiritual being that's clean. Prince of Persia is going to be a bad spiritual being that's unclean. But it's still an actual being that can touch and do and grab and do stuff. Does that make sense? So, yeah, he's trying to withstand him until a more powerful, Michael supposedly is the most powerful, comes through to to actively affect guys. This is what we see. There's just like we would see a war in heaven. These are not just ghosts flying inside and out of each other, you know, and wisping through each other. These are, this is an actual tangible. These people will touch each other and do things. So it's understanding the difference between a spiritual being and what that is ascribed as the scripture compared to us born of mankind, born of the dirt through the womb of a woman, right? We're made of a different physics. These unclean spirits, it's basically making like angels, but it, they were corrupted. Like the 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 rebellious angels of these uh, semyaza and his associates that took wives, their offspring was them not trying to make men. They were trying to make more of them, more of spiritual beings by using the womb of a woman because there's no female angels. There's no female spiritual beings in heaven. It was all males. So therefore, they using the woman, the woman, and, their, and the outcome was another spiritual being, except because it wasn't intended, and that was some sort of weird hybrid cross species, you have unclean spirits. They can't go into heaven. They can't. They're not welcomed. <laughs> they're unclean. Because, right? Because the Father only accepts the clean, right? That's part of his law. Does that make any sense? So, of course, they can interact. Of course. An actual spirit, princes of, of the air and darkness, wickedness, high places, can interact with a good angel if it wants to and withstand him for whatever reason, for however long he, I don't know, I don't know why that specific amount of time. But to me, it's a, it would only make sense if you have angels that come down and they realize they've sinned. And this is what the book of Enoch talks about, guys. These angels that sinned in the days of, of Jared and took wives, they knew what they were doing was wrong. And these are angels that came from heaven who had seen the class structure and the organization and the hierarchy of the angels in heaven. And they knew that there would be judgment that would be coming for them. So to me, and this is a speculation, this is the best I can offer. 
these angels that took wives and had kids by them, the reason why they're happy, because it says in chapter seven of Enoch that they taught them the art of cutting roots and other things, which is what helped produce the giants. They taught them basically enchantments and sorcery, uh, which is, you know, uh, witchcraft. Basically they taught them different, different things um, to manipulate the outcome of the women giving birth. And that's how they birth giants. So I don't know if that's how they created an actual spiritual being to come out of a womb of a woman being different than, you know, than a man's and why it was corrupted. It wasn't like a, an angel created by God. So it was an angelic style body, but that it was messed up. It was unclean. So just as if I could give you a comparison for those of you who know the Torah, if I can give you a comparison with the Torah, just as in the Torah, the father said he couldn't have anyone that had any kind of uncleanness or any kind of physical impairment approach his, his, his uh, tabernacle of the of meeting and offer sacrifice. So in the same way, because they were not Timim, they were, they were um, unclean, basically. They were not pure in their genetics nor in their, um, in their outward uh, cleanliness. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of people think, oh, that's unfair that the guy had a, a physical impairment. Well, technically, he couldn't be a priest because those are the ones that would bring it, come actually close to the presence of God. So an angel who has a baby and that baby comes out, is it going to be of a spiritual kind, of a species of his creation? But he cross-speciated with a man, with, with mankind, a woman from mankind, which does not come out the same. Does that make any sense? It he then the spiritual being that came out, this Nephilim, this fallen one that came out, is unclean perpetually, meaning it can't go to heaven and be near God. It can't be around God's presence. It is doomed in a sense, right? This is why, and and I, I, this is why I try to stress. And we've tried to stress in so many other, so many other videos that there's a difference. There's there's a double up. There's two applications of the word Nephilim used in scripture, both before the flood, which is where these unclean spirits came from, and then after the flood, which you do not see any angels sleeping with women again to create Nephilim, because the word Nephilim can also be used of just a tall man, right? A manipulated genetics, but it doesn't mean that their father was an angel. Does that make any sense? So this is why that's kind of a, a, a different side tangent topic, but Rob Skiba talks about this as well in, in, great detail, in great detail. But the idea is we're talking about the pre-flood babies between angels and women and what they specifically were that we saw Jubilees 10 talk about unclean spirits. Also, Enoch chapter 15 says the same thing as Jubilees 10, that these leftover disembodied spirits of the giants would now be on the earth to just to tempt mankind, oppress mankind and cause problems. So they can still interact with angels if they wanted to, they're just not going to win the battle. Does that make any sense? So that's, that's why uh, Gabriel can be detained by an unclean spirit ruling over a nation. And, and Michael can help out Gabriel if he needs to. Hopefully that's a thorough, decent answer for you. Um, let me check out the chat a little bit further, guys. Thanks for allowing me to, allow me to expand on that answer. Um, it's something I, I guess I've never really talked about on my channel, but I guess it's a it's a finite point that needs to be understood uh, so that you can have a better idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Abraham, I'm gonna have to. Add, I I can't answer this one tonight. Um, you know, you know what I think on that, but. At the same time, I'm actually developing a whole series that I'm going to be leading up to explaining that better. And Because tonight I'm just talking about the mobility of Satan. But as far as where Satan's base of operation is, um, I'm not I'm actually going to develop a, a whole series for that so that you guys can we can walk people through that to better understand the conclusion of that. So let me see here. I think I saw some other questions further up. From Master Soup, I think he had a question. In Jubilees 10, Noah is told how to heal diseases with the herbs of the earth. Can all sickness be attributed to demonic spirits? Um, that's a great question, man. I don't know. I don't know if all sickness can, because we, you know, we choose evil ourselves, like I talked about at the very beginning of the show tonight, right? Um, and this is where even in that verse I read to you from Jubilees, where he's talking, I'll go back to it real quick. Uh, mankind's responsible also for, you know, sin. 
So even in this passage here, I believe 10, where it says Satan is talking to God and he's like, please, you know, this is Mastema. Also, Mastema is another name for Satan in the book of Jubilees, which is why in the same passage it calls him Satan. Um, and he says, let some of them remain before you, let them hearken my voice and do all that I say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I should not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are for corruption leading astray before my judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. So, um, like like we read also that men is enticed to sin, James 5, right? or James uh, chapter 1. So man is enticed to sin, but this is, Satan knows that, right? Great is the wickedness of the sons of man. They want to sin. They're going to sin, and I'm just going to help them. I'm going to be there when they do, right? And I'm going to entice them to, to make their sin worse and give them lots of opportunity to sin, tempt them as much as I can. But he knows men will take the bait, right? So this is where um, can all sickness be attributed to monk spirits? I would say no. I said we make our own choices that may cause uh, sickness to put toxicity in our bodies or be around toxicity to cause our bodies to develop sickness in some capacity. So it looks like, oh, one second, let me take this back off. Looks like uh, we had another question. Shannon Lowe 2000 is asking, why no female angels? Does Father expound on that? Only in First Enoch chapter, I believe it's uh, 15, he talks about how um, you were created in heaven and you were not appointed wives. That's all it really expounds on it. He doesn't say why he created all male angels. He just says that you were not appointed wives. And so I I basically didn't stop you from taking wives on the earth so that you could claim that I was withholding anything from you. But now look at all the, all the problems it's caused, right? Because you weren't supposed to do that. You're supposed to live in heaven. They're supposed to live on the earth. You're just sent down there to help them. But you transgressed the order. And you know this is the conversation that you see in Enoch for between Enoch chapter 7 through chapter 15. So go check that out when you have a chance. Sean Davis is asking, are the 200 million creatures that come out of the earth the other 90% of the unclean spirits, or are they totally separate beings? That's a great question. It's my suspicion that they are the other 90% let out of wherever they're put down into. And this is why we have a specific angel, the same angel that's mentioned and introduced in the Apocalypse of Abraham that has the key to the abyss. Uh, that's why he shows up in Revelation 9-1 to actually open the abyss. And uh, so that we see those chains that are being used. Um, so, because the, you know, the Apollyon, the Abaddon that comes out with him, who's the king over those unclean, these, uh, these creatures that come out of the pit, he's their angel over him, over them, right? So they're all... This is what I've tried to make a, a strong case for in my Apollyon video, that that is the Antichrist, that is the first beast who's subject to Satan, is this Apollyon character who comes out of the, the pit uh, with these other entities to, to do his bidding and cause havoc on the earth. And we start you know, this amazing, horrible time of 42 months on the earth leading up to the, the return of the Messiah. And that's why he specifically is able to overcome the two, two witnesses three days before the Messiah returns. Um, as Revelation 11 talks about, because it's uh, he's very powerful, basically. So, and the things that are working with him go out and do some dastardly things. So, this is uh, I I would say yes to to the first option in your in your question. Lisa Brewer, yes. If you look at the language, though, uh, she's talking about the angels in the Book of Enoch. Says they were bound for seventy generations. You also have to look at the other mentions of them because that's an idiomatic phrase, 70 generations, which if you look at the, in, in the same book of Enoch, it talks about how they are not let out until their judgment. This is actually the judgment is proclaimed over them in Enoch chapters nine and 10. And that judgment that, that they're let out for is from all my understanding, the great white throne judgment, which is why it says in revelation 20, 11 through 15, um, he brings, you know, all the dead, everything in Sheol, which Tartarus is just a lower compartment of Sheol. Um, Tartarus is where they were bound in, in the book of Enoch. So the, everything that's in there, all the unclean spirits that are that are destroyed, all the souls of men who are not righteous, all the imprisoned angels, they're all brought before Yeshua at the great white throne judgment at the end of millennial reign, and then they're, they're thrown in the lake of fire and extinguished from existence. So this, a lot of people think the 70 generations idea, they try to do the math on what's a generation. And if it's this much, then that means they was that, does that mean they were let out, you know, in the early 20th century, stuff like that. And a lot of that gets speculated upon because of um, not taking the other descriptions of their judgment 
directly into play into the context of this. And so they just run with the 70 generations idea. And they think that all these other angels are already let out, but that's not what the book of Enoch says. And you don't need the other angels, by the way, guys, if you read in, in Enoch chapter, um, Enoch chapter seven, I believe it is where it talks about Azazel taught men warfare and taught them the metals of the earth and how to work them. And then taught women basically, um, behavior that would lead to fornication. So what do you see in the world forever? Those are the main traits that you see in the world or those major, major traits that we see in all corrupted civilizations, um, constant warfare, uh, constant idea of trying to get, um, over sexualized societies and, um, this system that we call money, which evalu is evaluated mostly upon metals and then the value of metals and also making weapons of warfare, right? So you don't need the other Semyaza and the other angels to be let out. Satan is, is tricky enough. He knows enough to, to do what everything we've seen done and all the evil that we see run up on the earth in history. He, that's, he, and he's got all these other cohorts. That's what I was reading the Jubilees passage for us tonight, right? He's got all these other 10th part of, we don't know how many that is. It's a lot. I would imagine it's, it's a lot. It's because we don't know how many actual Nephilim there were before the flood, before they are all killed. So we don't know how much the hundred percent of them was much less just 10% of them was, but I would suggest that it is a lot, a whole, whole lot. Um, so anyway, uh, so you got Satan ruling over those guys and those guys are sent out to the earth to spread Satan's message and trickery and deception. You don't need the other angels. You've Satan's got, they're doing just fine tricking the whole world as revelation 12, nine says. So that's, that's the way I would understand it. Uh, looks like Jeremiah 15, 16 is asking, do you believe in the end times? Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. These are what's called the last days, everything. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not being tongue in cheek. I'm going to explain this. There's a lot of references in scripture that everything after Yeshua is called the last days, but specifically, are we in the end times as in, as in like stuff happening in the days of revelation? Um, I think that we're getting very close to be honest with you. I, I personally think that with everything going on in the world, I think it, uh, I'm not obviously not going to set a date of any kind, but I personally think that it, we, we've got another 50 to 70 years before possibly things could get closer toward the revealing of a polyon. Like I talk about in my polyon video, that is the only thing you need to worry about. So the world can, can go crazy and act crazy, but until a polyon shows up, that's the moment when you know you got 42 months till your shoe returns. Whenever you see a polyon show up and the world's wondering after him, Revelation 17, 8, they wonder after the beast. And you start seeing mass, mass problems like second brute 27, apocalypse saver in chapter 31, Revelate the, the four horsemen concepts are happening. Yeah, the bolt, the, the, uh, the trumpet judgments start happening. Uh, you start seeing warfare, famine, disease on a mass scale across the world. That's to me, that's, and all of it's led by Apollyon, whom the world is looking to. So that means everyone knows he's here. To me, that's that's when you know you're in the true end times. You got 42 months of Apollyon before you have the return of Yeshua. So we have another question here from David Shear. Oh no, he's just he's just helping out. Thank you all, admins and mods. I really appreciate you guys. Um, I've been trying to think of something special I can do for y'all. And I think I figured it out. So I think I'll be reaching out to all of y'all um, here shortly to, to explain that, to just bless you for, for being here and blessing me by helping out in the chat. Kingdom Truther is asking, can you do a podcast on the seven shepherds and eight principal men and Micah five who are these characters? Yes, I can put it on the list, brother. Andy Pandy is asking, do you think CERN will open the pit? Uh, personally, no, it's, it's an angel with a key. So I don't, I don't know. Guys, I don't know. I know what people say about CERN. I know what the official narrative is for CERN, and I know what people conspire about CERN as far as what they think CERN could be doing. Um, I don't know if that, if I don't, I don't quite agree with all of that because much of it doesn't, isn't like a biblical application of concepts, but I definitely don't believe that the official narrative from the, the government of Switzerland, according to what they think, what they claim they're doing at CERN. I definitely don't believe that. But all the conspiracies about it, I uh, really struggle as well because I don't, I don't know. So, apologize. I'm not the best person to ask about CERN because I don't think anyone has an, has the right idea on what they're doing. 
um, doesn't so much of it doesn't line up with scripture. And I don't believe the official narrative either. So Daily Jacobson is asking, why is it some of us have had no interaction or awareness of evil spirits? <laughs> so you think you ever found yourself tempted to sin, bro? <laughs> yes, you have your own lusts and enticements that cause you to sin. But at the same time, this is their job to set things in front of you that might cause you to sin. You have no clue, man. Like you're living in an, if you, uh, Dolly, if you're, if you're in the United States, you're living in a situation right now in your town, more than likely, depending on where you live, or li definitely in your state where you have an occultic facility that does child sacrifice daily. That is the byproduct, the effects, the, the, the outcome of unclean spirits. You've had interaction. You have awareness of them. You just have to call them what they are according to God's behavior versus the devil's behavior versus the enemy's behavior. So, I mean, you've, and you, and you would never know if you're actually talking with someone who's under the influence um, of an unclean spirit, because it depends like if they could just be enticing or leading you into false beliefs and false narratives, uh, they don't actually have to be manifesting some kind of demon, like in, like in some sort of exorcist movie. Right. It's not always like that. It's much more subtle, guys. If it was that obvious, no one would fall for it. It's never that obvious. That's a hyperbolic example from from uh, you know Hollywood that's intended to try to make you think you've never interacted with them because they, they they want you to think that if you ever saw one, it would look crazy, right? Like some sort of weird ghost in in the Conjuring or something like that. No, it's much more subtle than that. Christina B is asking, do you believe Azazel in Enoch is the one who convinced the Watchers to sin? maybe in the hopes of gaining a tenth of the evil spirits or children for his bidding. That would be, I mean, that, you know, that would be a lot of speculation on his part. Cause if you add up, I mean, that's a good thought, but if you look at the timeline of events that I read to you tonight, you have, you know, Satan already causing mischief with Adam and Eve in the garden. And then several hundred years later in the days of Jared, you have the, these other angels, good angels that are, that are shown up to help mankind. And then they get enticed. It doesn't say anywhere in the book of Enoch that's that Azazel enticed those other angels to do what they did because those other angels, like I talked about, they even went into their own pact. They even made their own oath that they were all going to do this together because they called it a great sin. They knew what they were doing. Did Azazel somehow deceive them into doing that that's a great speculation and it's actually the same speculation i use in my days of the deluge story <laughs> because it, it does seem to make a lot of sense if he's you know able to trick both mankind and angels but it the text just doesn't literally say that so that would be speculation but it's a uh, it's a good one though now as far as the children though i don't know if he would have known how many they were going to have to know he would get a tenth of them and that god would actually grant that that would be that would be beyond speculation in my opinion that would just be he would not he would yeah i don't know if he would know that or not uh let me see here Aiden rose is asking do unclean spirits respond to both the names jesus or yeshua yeah i've seen it bro they respond to the name jesus it is guys guys the sacred name stuff <laughs> I, I, I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. Genesis 11, the father gave us different languages. Terms, nouns, names, all of them translate into different languages. A different language is not a curse. It Well, technically it is. It's the curse of Genesis 11. But it the father was the one who did that. He knew we're all going to be speaking different languages. Do you guys remember me reading in uh, the book of Enoch, chapter 107? Where it talks, I was talking about this in my Enoch debate, and I've talked about this in other passages about Enoch, um, where I, in my milk and meat presentation, where I talked about um, heaven's Bible given to Enoch, Enoch and Jacob. In the book of Enoch, he literally, I think it's in chapter 103. Um, let me go find it and I'll read it for us real quick, okay? Father knew that he was going to do the Tower of Babel. Enoch already knew there were going to be multiple languages in the future. And he talks about it. So just because we speak in another language doesn't mean that that language is cursed and that the father can't hear our prayers because we're using his son's name or his name in another language. 
the father knows our hearts, man. He's, he doesn't require you to speak a certain language to get to him. In fact, he's the one who knew that Hebrew would go away after the Tower of Babel until he taught it to Abraham, specifically through a, through a miraculous event with an angel in Jubilees chapter 12. So he knew that the world would speak different languages. So let me try to find this real quick for us. And this might, I'll just put the words on the screen for us if possible, if I can find it real quick. I think I, my memory is breaking. It's not in 108. Okay, here it is, guys. Let me pull this over for us to look at. And all right, let's look at it together. Let me make it bigger. One second, guys. All right. This is uh, Enoch 104, 10 through 13. He says, and I know, and then now I know this mystery that sinners will alter and pervert the words of righteousness in many ways and will speak wicked words and lie and practice great deceits and write books concerning their words. But when they write down truthfully all my words in their languages and do not change or diminish aught from my words, but write them all down truthfully, all that I first testify concerning them, then I know another mystery that books will be given to the righteous and the wise to become a cause of joy and uprightness and much wisdom. And to them shall the books be given and they shall believe in them and rejoice over them. And then shall all the righteous who have learned therefrom all the paths of uprightness be recompensed. And do you guys want to see, let me pull, I'll pull this slide up real quick for you and I'll show you this prophecy came true um, in our, in our last 2000 years. Let me just pull this up real quick. I have this the slide from my morning cup of context. Or no, no, actually it was it wasn't that. It was my um season two finale for Honor of Kings. One second, let me get it to you real quick. All right, I may have to just go to the video real quick. I, I can't remember where the slide is. But I'll I'll show you this actual passage came true and I made a graph showing it to come true. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Okay. Here it is. Okay. You guys all see this? You guys see this? Uh, I'll make it bigger. So this is an actual graph of the different languages both before Yeshua's day, during the last uh, 1900 years, and then now in the modern day, after the Dead Sea Scroll findings, that we have five different languages that the Book of Enoch was found in. And guys, this is exactly what Enoch was talking about in 10 through 13 of chapter 104, that his words be written down and preserved many languages. So this is before the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, because the Tower of Babel takes place after the flood. So According to supposedly this this prophecy from Enoch, the Tower of Babel would take place approximately anywhere from 800 to 1,000 years later. So this is, the father knew that we were going to be speaking different languages, and he knew that that people in Ghana are going to call, are going to use a version of French to call on the name of the of God for salvation. He's not going to limit your access to him for salvation because of the language you speak. He knows you speak a different language, He's the one who put that on the world. <laughs> so, and we're not going to all speak the same language again, uh, in my opinion, until we actually get to um, uh, the end of the millennial reign, which is why one of the gifts of the spirits is speaking in tongues, which means speaking in different languages, because we're going to have to use that as resurrected saints to communicate with all the survivors of the day of the Lord from all over the world where they come from, all speak in different languages. And we're going to teach them how to love Jesus, how to love the Father. So this is, it's all part of his plan. And yes, in my personal life, I've seen unclean spirits 100% respond to Jesus Christ. All right, I'll take a couple more questions, guys. Uh, thank you so much, Beetlejuice, 
for your super sticker. I really appreciate that. That's that's uh, very nice of you. Thank you so much. Thanks for blessing us. Hopefully, this has been a blessing to you guys tonight. Hopefully, um, um, that you know the scriptures that went over and everything that we're talking about. Hopefully that this has been edifying for you and you can help you in understanding better the context of scripture. Miss Catherine from Kenya, speaking of the African continent, welcome. Miss Catherine, what, what in your language, uh, that your native language in Kenya, what do you guys call God? Because I know it's not, it's probably not G-O-D because that's English. So let me know what you guys call God. Brandon H is saying, when in time did a third of the angels revolt from Yahweh? Yeah, brother, I think you may have showed up late. I just talked about that for the most of the show. I apologize. Go take a chance and after we finish and go rewatch the, the first part of the show, I explained that with great detail. No, Corey Fowler, we, we don't we don't practice or teach or promote sacred name theology here, brother. All right, so Joanne loves um Yes, I must have missed your question. So if I can, if you can put it in all caps, I can see it better. Otherwise, I don't see it. I must have scrolled past it. So, and also, if you put it earlier on in the show, my my software doesn't let me scroll up too far as far as the history of the live chat. So just retype your question and put it in all caps so that I can see it, and I'll gladly try to answer it for you, sister. Yeah, I can't. I don't see it anywhere. Uh, thank you, Todd Dot, T O D D O T. <laughs> I don't know how you say that, Todd Dot. Thank you, brother. Okay, guys, I'll take a couple more questions and then. Um, oh, here it is. Joanne loves, I think. Yeah, I don't think you put it in all caps. Try to put it in all caps, guys, so I can see it easier. According to my research, the Archangel Michael is being worshiped. Some even claim he's Jesus, but I know he's not. Why isn't the Archangel Michael stopping people from worshiping? Uh, you, I mean, that's uh, Jehovah's Witness stuff. And. You can't you can't stop people from doing nonsense like that's just the father doesn't um, like that's that would be like saying like why doesn't the father stop people from worshiping Satan right from actual Luciferianism and Satanism it's just because you know men the father will allow people to run their course of their wickedness and they'll either repent or they'll die in their sins um, he lets us do all kinds of nonsense that that he could stop us all from doing but that's um, yeah it just doesn't work like that unfortunately you know I wish it was that easy I really do. Okay, I guess JD94123 is feeling better. Good to hear that, brother. Thank you for letting us know. I think you weren't feeling too well a few nights ago. Appreciate it. All right, guys, I really appreciate everybody. Um, I don't see any other any other questions. Oh, wait, here, Stephanie Myers is asking, if we're to judge the angels, who are the angels we will judge? Why will they need judged? And is that during the millennial kingdom or for all eternity? Um, it, well, I think it would start at the millennial kingdom. And actually, let me go to the verse in Revelation 11. Let's take you have you have like a five part question. Let's take let's take part one real quick. It says, uh, who are the angels who need to be judged? That should be all of them. And and I'll explain that in just a minute. And then is that during millennial reign? Why will they need to be judged? Because they can sin. They can sin. Um, so therefore, they'll they actually. Actually, I'm going to go to two different places. We'll go to Revelation 11, and then I'll go to the Testament of Levi in the Apoc in the uh, Testament of Twelve Patriarchs. All right, guys. So here at the last trumpet in Revelation 11, we've got this unique statement. So the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, "The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of." our Lord and his Christ. That's two different things, guys, the father and the son, his, his Messiah, like this is the word Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worship God saying, we give you thanks O Lord God, the almighty, that's the father who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and begun to reign. And he does that through his Christ, through his Messiah, his son. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came. And the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and destroy those who destroy the earth. So that's a part of that. You guys remember the statement where it says that judgment begins with the house of God? That's us at the resurrection. But then once we get, we go through that judgment and we receive our reward, uh, because remember how Paul talks about 
your works, some of them will be burned up as with fire and some of them will remain. And as we talked about last night, Matthew chapter six, Father uh, Yeshua explains to us that let our light so shine before men that we see works and glorify your father in heaven. And that it is these good works that store treasures in heavens for us is our righteousness, our deeds that uh, are going to be rewarded to us. And this is the moment of judgment that it's talking about. The, the use of the word judgment doesn't always mean like bad judgment, right? It's actually just evaluating you. You're being judged. You're being evaluated on your behavior. So at the resurrection, those who take part in the first resurrection of the saints and the day of the Lord, that will be judged in a good way, so to speak, right? So the works that remain will remain. Uh, this is why Yeshua in Matthew 5, 19 and 20 talks about there'll be the least and the greatest in the kingdom amongst resurrected mankind. But because we're put into a position with Christ in this, in this Melchizedek priesthood, and we're made like Christ was. We're made into an um, into a a a body, a type of creation that is like the angels, but we have His law emblazoned on our heart, and we're put in a priesthood that is in greater authority than the angels, as Hebrews one talks about. This is why we will judge them, because they'll literally be be below us in their ability to to like they will still be able to sin and we will not this is one of the promises of the covenant enoch first enoch chapter 5 verse 6 through 9 is that we will never be able to sin again once we get our glorified bodies angels have always been able to sin and they're not going to get bodies greater than what they already have so therefore this is why we're destined to actually be over them in authority and we will have to judge them because they themselves have the propensity and the ability to sin and, and make decisions and we'll have to be, that doesn't mean that they're going to be like same kind of concept. It just because we judge the angels doesn't mean that they're going to get bad judgment, right? They just may be rewarded on their faithfulness to the father. You see what I'm saying? So it doesn't mean that the judgment's bad, but that's why it, it says in this passage, both your bond servants, the prophets and the saints, those are humans. And then those who fear your name, small and great, that'll be the other, the only other option out there, which would be the angels, those in the heavenlies, right? Because this is the moment where he comes back with the Messiah and the warrior angels to rout the wicked out, starts to establish his kingdom. And as a matter of first order in his kingdom is you have to decide placement for everything in your kingdom from, the, from your servants. And with that placement comes evaluation on what they are and what they can do. So this is judgment. So I hope that that helps a little bit. And so therefore it's at the start of the millennial reign um, and, and, for all eternity because we'll have this existence forever and so will they they're not going to die either but they don't get a greater existence they're, they're not promised anything like we are so they already have an angelic body they're happy they're good and the ones that love god's law will obviously um be obedient and faithful to the storyline which means that they'll be okay with us being in rulership over them as a as a priesthood that is kind of greater in authority than them if that makes any sense all right, guys. Um, great question. Trying to make it as simple as quick as possible. <laughs> that could be a much longer answer entire video, actually. Uh, last question, guys. Christina B. is asking, why did the father allow Satan to mess with Job? I always hear non-believers attack this story. Well, as, remember what we talked about, though. I didn't go into the full context of Job, but yes, father allows, technically, father allows Satan and the unclean spirits to tempt and test everybody, right? So it's all, it's not that um, the the. I mean, the traditional answer would be the father can do whatever he wants because he's the father, he's God, and he knew what Job could could take and what he couldn't. The more detailed answer that I hope people understand is that if you actually look into the story of Job, especially in chapter two, Job's family wasn't necessarily as righteous as Job, and that can incur problems. You see what I'm saying? So bad things happen. And Satan is as a part of that. But just like we talked about tonight, it is man's own sin and enticement, his own lust and his own problem within man, his own wickedness within man that gives the devil opportunity to act in your life for nefarious means. Job was being lauded by the father, but Job's family was not being lauded by the father. <laughs> we actually see Job's wife show some pretty nasty, nasty heart throughout that storyline. Job's children were just were killed and they were partying constantly. So Job's praying for them, hoping that they may not sin. So this is why we got to read the fuller context. Job is a righteous man. He's he lived through it. He suffered some some bad stuff as a result of what happened. Some heart, some heart uh 
some loss and some heartache and some grief. And uh, physically his body broke out, and I, whether that's from stress or from whatever was going on in the, in the destruction of what had happened or who knows. But uh, we know that, you know, it's, it says that Satan put upon him. But again, that's what was Job was doing was fearing. Even though Job was considered righteous, remember, we're not perfect while we're in this mortal body. During that storyline, Job is fearing for his family. And that is definitely not some, it, it's definitely not a mindset that we should um, persist in. Right. So nobody in that story is perfect. Job was really good amongst the other people. Right. But nobody's perfect. So there's a this is like the the general principle, like we talked about tonight for the from question one or maybe not. Maybe not. Um, what question was it? Number two, we talked about this man's enticement to sin is what gives this the, the devil and his cohorts uh, pathway to, to mess with your life. Does that make any sense? So the same thing applied with Job. It's not like God literally, yes, God literally says, yeah, don't, you know, don't take his life, but you know, you can lay a hand against the hedge that he put around him, the blessings that he put around him. And so those blessings were ripped away. And the test was, well, will Job curse you? You know, will Job turn from you? And Job did not. He did not do that. He remained faithful. Unfortunately, he did suffer some bad consequences because he did have sin in his life at the same time, because we all do, even when we do our best. This is why we need to get to the resurrection and only Yeshua can provide that for us. So this is why it's it's uh, kind of, we're dealing with some fundamental issues of sin and, and atonement here. Um, guys, I appreciate everybody. It looks like, <laughs> it looks like we've got uh, some other questions spurred from some of my answers here, but ultimately guys, I appreciate you guys so much. Um, Yes, Karen C., you're right. We learned so much through Job's story. And in fact, this is actually something that Ken Heidebrecht from Hanging on His Words, he and I are working on this. If you guys haven't already seen, already been to Ken's channel, subscribe, please go do so now. He's got an amazing channel. And uh, he's my co-host with Honor of Kings. And we're actually um, working on something for the future for one of his shows, True Sleuths, where we're going to be addressing Job and, and some other books. So we're excited for that in the future. Bless you guys. I really appreciate everyone being here and asking great questions and maintaining the fruit of the spirit. And um uh, uh, we just, uh, I'll leave you guys with a little special something. This is from Ken's upcoming album that he's going to be releasing. So go to his channel, Mountains in the Sea, and go subscribe uh, to his secondary channel, which he actually does incredible praise music. And I'll give you a little taste of it right here. If I saw the world through the eyes of the Father. 